Okay. Um, I'm doing, this is sort of two for one. Uh, I am doing uh, Mary Carol Caton. She was known as Polly. And she was the daughter of Charles Carroll of Carrollton, who lived in Dorega Manor. Mm -hmm. uh, and also Emily Jane Caton McTavish. And I'll do a little plug here for my, I belong to the Daughters of the American Revolution. And I am a member of the Mary Carol Caton chapter. And she is truly a daughter of the American Revolution, uh, being the daughter of Charles Carroll. Now, Mary Carol Caton was the eldest daughter of Charles Carroll of Carrollton. Um, and he was the signer of the Declaration of Independence um, for, Mar for the state of Maryland. And Mary Darnell Carroll. And they were one of the most prominent families in uh, the revolutionary era in the United States. Um, you, the, here is the uh, picture of Charles Carroll Carrollton and his wife, that's her parents, Mary Carroll Caton's parents. Now they lived at Doregan Manor, which most of you know is I think on Frederick Road, uh, right up the road from the uh, Historical Society. Um, he was you know, very famous in Maryland as uh, the signer of the Declaration of Independence, and he served the Continental Congress before coming, becoming a Maryland state senator. He was also the third wealthiest man in the United States. And I will go ahead and answer the question now because I get this every time that I say this. When I say Charles Carroll was the third wealthiest man in the United States at that time, and people always say to me, well, who was first and second? Not the first, the wealthiest man at the time during the revolution was John Hancock. From, he was in New York. John Hancock uh, inherited much of his wealth, but he certainly increased it through shipping and real estate in New York. So he was the wealthiest man. And these men also contributed a lot of their wealth to the revolution. So we are thankful for that. And we owe them a debt of gratitude for that. The second wealthiest man was Robert Morris, who lived in Philadelphia. And he also made his money uh, in the shipping industry. He, um, he did not start out with wealth. He earned his. He uh, came here. Uh, from England and started working and built his wealth in shipping the shipping industry. <clears throat> so um, now Charles Carroll uh, certainly knew all of the founding fathers. He had developed a close relationship with George Washington during the revolution. And this became very beneficial for Mary. Uh, because he would often take her on, um, she traveled with him on several business occasions, uh, on one such trip while in New York in 1789, Mary Ning, uh, mingled with the elite politicians and their families, and she quickly uh, made a good impression. She became known for her grace and amiable qualities, as well for her beauty and was a particular favorite to George Washington himself. She was, um, she was uh, Charles Carroll's oldest daughter. She had two other siblings that managed to live to adulthood. Char her brother Charles, who was born in 1785, and she had a sister Kitty, uh, Catherine, who was born in 1789. Now, uh, a later account, describing her as one of the most charming ornaments of the Republican court. <laughs> and this was a great advantage uh, to her because she moved in very high society circles. She certainly met and spoke with all of these very intelligent men that you see on the screen. Uh, and Charles Carroll was um, 
a very intelligent man himself. He was a, reputedly a master of languages and law, and he had a genuine love of books. And he made sure that his children were very well educated as well and his grandchildren, and that included the girls, which at this time in this era, education for women was not really considered a priority. But he wanted to make sure that the girls and the boys were well educated in areas of finance, business, investing, and commerce. Now, Mary Carol Caton, um, it's well, evidence shows that Mary had a certain amount of freedom to make her own decisions at age 16. And despite her father's plan for her to marry a relative, she became engaged to a man named Richard Caton. Um, uh. A merchant, he was a merchant, recently arrived in Maryland. And Charles Carroll wrote to Daniel Carroll and said, dear cousin, my daughter, I'm sorry to inform you, is much attached to and has engaged herself to a young English gentleman of the name of Caton. I do sincerely wish that she had placed her affections elsewhere, but I do not think myself at liberty to control her choice when fixed upon a person of unexceptional character. <laughs> or would you, I am sure, desire that I should? And this is sort of the whole thing in a nutshell. Uh, Richard Caton was sort of a near do well, maybe a gambler, um, wasn't really financially responsible. And you can see that Charles Carroll saw this right off the bat, uh, but he permitted Mary to marry. Richard Caton in 1787 on Caton's word that he would free himself of all debt and establish himself in a business in which he could support a family. So soon enough, Caton had joined a mercantile firm for cotton textile manufacturing. Um, and Mary would take care of, um, he would continue to work. Well, he worked, but he also had times when he would invest in adventures that were not quite so profitable. <laughs> so, but Mary and Richard um, would raise four daughters and they would live in Catonsville. Uh, Catonsville was named for the Catons. Charles Carroll had invested heavily in the Baltimore Frederick Turnpike which is, you know, our Route 144 today. He also owns some property in Catonsville. And so he um, built the house in Catonsville. Now, some historians disagree on this, but uh, there was a house in Catonsville called Castle Thunder. And Castle Thunder was the home of Richard and Mary Caton. Now, some of the historians disagree this, uh, this house used to be located where the Catonsville Library is today. They tore the house down many years ago. And then on that property, they built uh, the, the Catonsville Library. But then some historians disagree and say Charles Carroll would never build a house on the main road there um, where it sat right on the road where cattle and sheep were constantly going up and down the street. And so there is some controversy as uh, to whether that really was the house or not. Uh, but there is a sign in Catonsville that says uh, where Castle Thunder was located. And it was the home of Mary and Richard Caton. Now, Mary Carol Caton had four daughters. And three of the daughters were known as the three American Graces. There was Mary Ann. Elizabeth and Louisa. And they had the charm and the intelligence and the wit uh, the same as their mother. And they, um, here they are in later years. Now, her three elder daughters, 
um, went on to marry English aristocracy. Uh, Elizabeth, Marianne, and Louisa all moved to England and married into English aristocracy. Wow. Marianne, Marianne first married Robert Patterson here in Baltimore. That was the brother of Elizabeth Patterson and her husband, Jerome Bonaparte. And you've heard the stories of them. Uh, after Robert died, she married Richard Wellesley, who was the first Marquess of Wellesley. Elizabeth married Sir George Strafford, eighth Baron of Strafford, and Louisa married Colonel Sir Felton Bathurst Hervey, who was the first baronet. Um, and then after, after the baronet died, she married Francis Darcy Osborne, the seventh Duke of Leeds. So they were the Marchioness or Lady Wellesley, Baroness Strafford, and the Duchess of Leeds. Now these ladies uh, moved to England, they stayed in England, uh, they're buried there, but Emily was the one that stayed here in Maryland and stayed in Howard County. Um, and she uh, took care of the family. She took care of the finances uh, for the sisters. And Emily married John Lovett McTavish. And here's, this is Emily and that's John and Emily McTavish. Uh, she married him. He was a British counsel to the Port of Baltimore and a fur trader and merchant. Okay. And Emily stayed here and she managed the, the sister's fortunes and Charles Carroll favored her greatly above the others, uh, maybe because she stayed and probably because she was very, very intelligent, but it caused a little bit of strife in the family. Now, since John McTavish was not of high aristocracy, Carroll built Carrollton Hall for Emily to keep um, so she could keep her station in life and that her status would be as great as that of her sisters. <laughs> now, Carrollton Hall is out off of the Homewood Road. If you know where the uh, Shrine of St. Anthony is, the Franciscan Friars, this building is there. That is where Emily lived. And at one time it was part of the Doregan Manor property. And, um, she lived there for the rest of her life with her family. Um, later on in life, when Mary, her mother, Mary Carol Caton, became ill, Mary Carol Caton came here and stayed with her until her death. But it was an impressive home for the time. She had a thousand acres of land. The house was a very luxurious house for that time. But this uh, helped Emily to stay at a status that was comparable to her sisters. Now, Emily, as well as her sisters, were very well educated for this era. I mean, normally in this period, when a woman got married, everything went to the husband the day she got married. But the Caton ladies, the Caton sisters, managed their own finances and estates and they made investments and they bought and sold stocks and bonds and they were wealthy in their own right. They were independently wealthy in an era where usually the husband dominated everything. And Charles Carroll was a very forward thinking in providing a well-rounded education for his granddaughters. And then I also think he was trying to avoid the situation that he had with his daughter where she married uh, a man who was not capable of managing his own finances. Uh, when Richard Caton died, he was insolvent and he only had 2000 pounds to his name. And uh, conversely, when Mary uh, died and passed away, she had uh, 167,000 pounds and you know her finances which today is the equivalent of maybe 19 million dollars so you would say, you can uh -huh. see 
that she was a very, very wealthy woman and they managed their um, finances very well. Um, there is a book out called uh, The Three American Graces. It was written by Jahan Wake. It's an, a very interesting book on these ladies and the American Graces. And um, I met Jahan, she came here and, and did a lecture for us <clears throat> years ago. And she lives in England and I asked her, I said, how in the world did you write this book about American women? And she said that she was doing research. And when she was doing the research, she saw all these letters written by um, Louisa and Marianne and Elizabeth. And in her letters, she, they were talking to Emily saying, well, uh, I want you to buy this much in stock and sell this property and buy bonds here or sell this stock. And she was so intrigued by the fact that women in the 1700s were so financially astute that she continued her research and that resulted in the book of the Three American Graces. So um, she's, uh, it's, you know, they really are some fascinating women. You can see that they were way ahead of their time. Uh, Charles Carroll was just wonderful at making sure that they were educated and continued. So um, anyway, Emily maintained her social activities. She kept a very close connection with the Catholic Church uh, in the area and with her wit and charm and her gracious home she lived a full life.